Welcome to part eight of the network security module. Here we'll be looking at how to obtain the good data. So um, as we discussed before, finding correctly labeled malware data is really hard from the real environment because we don't uh, we don't know how we can find it and we don't know how we can classify it. And definitely it's hard to find enough data that it is representative. So one way of doing it is to build what is demonstrated here, a honeypot or a honey net where we have machines that we infect or let infect and then see how they behave. And so as a starting point, the honeypot would be a more or less closed environment where we can run the malware in a controlled fashion. But as also illustrated on the figure here, we do need, in order to observe how the traffic looks like, we do need some kind of internet access in order to see how they interact with the command and control servers. That's one part. Here we have that we have the malicious data set that we can do in the honeypot, but somehow we need to mix the malicious data set from the honeypot with the benign traffic that we have from another network. And we need to do it in a way that you cannot easily differentiate between them. So for example, if I just had my local data and my uh, uh, with the malware, and then my non-malicious data and I mix it, I could easily see it based on IP addresses would be different. Maybe uh, there would be all different patterns if I had more TCP or UDP traffic in one than another. Uh, so um, we have to make sure that we don't introduce any bias in the data when we do it like this. Um, so what I've written here is that we have to make sure that there are no specific characteristics that would be interpreted wrongly as specific to malicious or benign traffic. Another example of that could be if I had very short communication times in my honey pot because it's mainly a local network, and then I would have a short time between uh, sending packets and receiving acknowledgement. That would look different in a real network, and then the system could wrongly interpret it as uh, if communication with a short delays would be malicious and long delays would be non-malicious. Um, also, we should be aware that we kind of lose information when we're doing this. For example, bot generated traffic cannot be assumed to be independent of all kind of traffic. It could be that I have a specific bot which works only if I'm using a, a web browser at the same time and therefore just mixing the data set, uh, I'm losing that uh, connection between the behavior or the human behavior or the system's behavior and and um, and what is generating or not generating the, the partner traffic. And also just to mention that sometimes you can discuss what should be labeled malicious and non-malicious. So you have a, you might have a botnet that initially or an infected machine which initially just check am I connected to the internet? Can I make a Google request? Or can I check if the Windows timestamp uh, server is available? And that might not in itself be a malicious or harmful activity, but would we consider it malicious because it's initiated by a, a, a malicious piece of software? That's a good question. Um, so if it is one request, maybe not. If it is 10 requests, when do, where is the border between malicious and non-malicious traffic? That's also something that is non-trivial. Uh, so once we have the data set with malicious data and the data set with the non-malicious data, one way of mixing it is really by mapping it together. So as shown here, I have um, uh, two kind of traffic. I have my um, bot trace file, which is uh, done locally. And then I have a larger network where I have a background traffic trace file, which I believe is non-malicious. So on the ne next slide, I will show how these can be mapped together. So here I, I see the, my infected machine and I take um, all the um, all the traffic from the infected machine and then I map it until one of the machines I had creating my background traffic. So that mapping could be done by taking the IP uh, addresses and just changing the IP address. And similarly, I would have another infected machine, uh, so I could have two, and they could be mapped into, into different machines of the, um, of the background traffic. In this way, I would get end out with a traffic trace that would contain both malicious and non-malicious traffic. And the uh, malicious traffic would come from computers who are also generating enormous, no, a normal uh, non-malicious traffic. But still I have to be aware not to introduce any bias um, uh, in the way I do it, for example, uh, by this uh, 
by this timing issue. So how do we generate these malicious data sets? It's something I did uh, touch upon very shortly by mentioning the honeypot. Um, one of, one uh, example is what is called a U honey jar, uh, where we are trying to handle some of the challenges that we uh, that we experience. First of all, the bot should be brought to believe that it's actually part of a working network, because if it doesn't, if it would just leave the computer and has no human human interaction with the computer, no web browsing, and no use of other programs, etc., the bot code might identify that something is wrong, that uh, it might uh, uh, interpret this as it is in a closed environment, and therefore it would behave differently than if it was on a normal computer. So again, keep in mind that those doing the botnet uh, are also trying to make sure that if we try to study the behavior, if we uh, install it in order to, to run a honeypot, that it doesn't behave as usual. Also, it should be secure, uh, secure from the outside world. Uh, so even if we only allow small amounts of traffic, such as command and control traffic, we should make sure that we don't harm anyone else, both for legal and for ethical reasons. Um, and it should be possible to operate, monitor, and control the system without too much work. So it should be as automatized as possible. Uh, in the setup we have here in Auburn University, we have been running up to 300,000 different kind of malware, or different malware samples, at least some of them are very much alike. But in order to run this large amount of malware, we have to make sure that we can do it efficiently and automatically. Um, therefore, it should also be, be easy to reset infected machines to wipe them in order to run new experiments. And then I will say um, a little bit about, about Honeyjar in the next presentation. And already now say uh, give credits to the master students who have done such a large part of the work um, with the setup that we have. And this is something we will look into in the next video. So for now, please take quiz number 14 and see you again uh, shortly. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, see you soon.